God bless you for choosing to listen to this anointed message from Dr. Reverend Christopher Abulame of King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations. Jesus. And Father, we give you praise for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So this morning we're going to share together from the book of Genesis, chapter 26. Chapter 26. We're sharing together from the book of Genesis, chapter 26. And what I want to be talking about today is the path to greatness. The path to greatness. I have meditated on this word or, the, or this verse of scripture, verse 13, for a while now since the year began. And it has not left me. And it says in verse 13, and the man waxed great and went forward. And grew until he became very great. What was his path to this greatness? How did Isaac come to be described in this fashion? And can a man other than Isaac be described in this fashion? I believe yes. Because God is the same yesterday. He's the same today. And he's the same forever. What he did for one, he can do for another. Uh, when, when I look at the Bible and I see what God has done for anybody, I can go to God and say, if you did it for him, you're going to do it for me too. God is not a respecter of person, but he is a respecter of principles. He stands by his word. So if he did it for one, I have the audacity to go to him and say, God, if you did it for Isaac, you can do it for me. And he's not going to say no, because he did it for Isaac. Glory to God. And so here we see the word of God says, and the man waxed great, and the man went forward, and the man grew until the man became very great. Glory to God. And a lot of time, the reason we don't get from God, what the fullness of what God has for us is either we have no faith in God, or we have no faith in the word of God, or we're not praying the promises of God. We're not praying the promises of God. So I dare to pray the promises of God regarding this scripture. Now, how did Isaac get here? From verse 1, the Bible said there was a great famine in the land. And Isaac saw this. Not everything that you see should scare you. Not everything that you see should scare you, other than God. I mean, you cannot stand when God appears. And I've told us this. Because our capacity cannot carry the divine, the power of God. And you remember when John, John the beloved saw Jesus Christ in his glorified form. The Bible says he fainted. He was like a dead man. And Jesus had to reach out to him and did some spiritual CPR. Get him back to life. So our capacity cannot carry God. And God only revealed to us to the extent that we can carry him. So what you have is not the fullness of God. I only have just a bit of God in me. And that's just all right. I can sure walk with that. So Isaac saw the famine. And the Bible says it was like the famine in the days of Abraham. It was just like what his father experienced. Sometimes we relieve our experiences. There are times that we relieve the things that we have lived before. But those times doesn't mean that God has abandoned you, abandoned me. Doesn't mean God is not in there. In the beginning, the Bible said the Lord created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form. And the earth was void. And now there was chaos in the earth. In the then earth before it was created. So creation was really bringing things to order. That's what creation was about. Bringing things to order. So what I'm trying to say, in chaos, God can bring order. He has the power to bring order when things are chaotic. And just the fact that things are chaotic doesn't mean God is not there. Now think about the valley of the dry bones and the man of God. Look at all of the bones scattered in the valley. The skull was over there. The femur was over there. The humerus was over there. 
The, the heat bone was over there. You couldn't even recognize what bone belonged to who. There was serious chaos in the valley of dry bone. And God said to the man of God, do you think that these things can come back to life? Not, I mean, it would have been okay to say, well, do you think that they can come together? God went beyond just bringing them together. To, can, can these things come alive again? And now you just feel you are in the valley of your dry bones. Life, life seems to turn topsy-turvy. Everything is upside down. There's chaos everywhere. You look your left, your right. Everything seems to be walking against you. And God shows up and says, do you think that things can ever be the same again? You say, God, let's talk about bringing things to order first before we talk about bringing things to where it used to be. But God, God knows how he would do what he wants to do and when he would do what he wants to do. And therefore, my job is to just work with him and just believe him and trust him. And I, I always say this. Uh, when I go to fly and you got an airport, you got through security and you come into this huge thing that looks like a big balloon and then, and then sometimes the, the, the cockpit is locked. You don't even know who the pilot is. You walk right in, you go take your seat. And the plane takes off. And, and some of us just feel okay. You feel good about it. You're, you're settled in your mind that whoever is the pilot can take you to where you're going. And, and, and I, all of the time I have flown, I never once heard about the qualification of the pilot. Never once thought if he is on drug or he has been doing alcohol, Overnight before he came on the plane. Never thought of that. I take my seat and the man says, strap yourself. And I strap my seat. Whatever he asks me to do, I do. I just obey instructions. <laughs> and I don't even know him. I don't, I've not seen him. I don't know who he is. I've never met him. But I commit my life to him. And I believe he would take me to my next stop. Why can't I just act like that with God? To commit my life. Yes, I don't see God. Just like I don't, I don't know that pal. I didn't see him. I, no, I don't know him. Why can't, why can't I just commit my life to God the same way? And get into that plane with God, strap myself, and go to sleep. But that's not what we do, ladies and gentlemen. We ask God why, when, how. We ask all of this question. We hear the word of God. We walk out of church and feel... That, that, I don't know. I know God can do all things, but I, I don't know about that. I, I know God can heal headache, but I, I don't know if he can heal my bone pain. I, I know God can, can fix everything, but I don't know if he can fix my finances. And so we question God. We believe other things than we believe God. Yet God has power over every single thing. I'd rather believe God than I believe the pilot. <laughs> Glory to God. And, and, and so you, you see here that Isaac experienced the same thing that his father experienced. But he believed the God of his father. And as he wanted to make a decision, a life-changing decision, and because God loved him, and because God loved his father Abraham, God Almighty stepped in. Sometimes God stepped into our decision. And the question will, is, would I let him, would I listen to him, would I obey him? And Isaac packed his stuff in, and took his wives and all of them and said, there's famine in the land, we're going into Egypt. Look at what the Bible says in verse 1. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. He said, there was famine beside the first in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of Philistine, and, and, unto Gerah. And in verse 2, and the Lord appeared unto him and said, go not down into Egypt. God said, don't go into Egypt. Now, imagine you're packing up, you're leaving town. God said, don't leave. What do you do? 
And some of you will say, well, that's the devil. That's that gotta be it's not God. That's the devil. God will interrupt your life because he loves you. God knew what was going to happen in Egypt. But God would not let him, his son, his own baby, move into Egypt because Egypt was not going to pay him. He was never going to be successful in Egypt. He would be lost in Egypt. And God stepped in and said, no, don't move. And sometimes you want to change a job, and God said, no, don't change that job. Lord, my boss is not acting. God said, stay there. I have, I have a purpose for you in there. You want to move out of the neighborhood. Everybody's acting crazy. In this. God says, stay there. You are the light of the world. You're the salt of this earth. I got a purpose for you that you have no idea what I want to do in your life. Isaac saw Egypt, creator of civilization. The food over there. Where he was at, there was famine. No food, no job, nothing was happening for anybody. It, there was enough reason for a man to move his family to a place where they find food. And no, God said, you ain't going nowhere. You're not going nowhere. You stay right here. I know there's famine in there. Stay right here. If, if you want to, if you really want to be great like Isaac, if I want to be great like, like Isaac, I must be willing to have 100% obedience to God in what he says, whether or not I understand it. The test of obedience is a test that every and any man or woman who wants to be a great man or great woman before God, we must pass. And it's not easy to pass the test of obedience. You got to be broken enough you have to be in God enough to trust God when God said move and you move. Or God says stay and you stay. See, I was listening or uh, watching television the other day. And there were training dogs. And one of the things they said was to be qualified police dog. The first thing is that the dog need to be able to obey, stay stay and this this dogs will be tempted the thing that they like the best will be before them what they like the best will be placed in front of them and that the handler says to them stay and some of them won't because they want to get that thing that they love so much but the ones that are able to resist the temptation and they remain those are the ones that qualify. They won't qualify. And, and the same thing with us. And God, God, God allows that thing that tempts you. That, that great job that you've been praying for. And it's right there in front of you. That great thing that you've been praying for. It's right there in front of you. And God says stay. Stay right there. And you're looking at it. You, uh, some of us say, wait, is the devil speaking? How can God, how on earth would God say to me, don't receive what i've been praying for what i've been desiring for how can he say that say no it's not god but it may just be god testing my ability to stay my staying ability because that's what's going to help me in times of crisis to be able to stay with god so god god tests my my obedience he tests my ability to stay and so Isaac, I say, look at Egypt. Oh, yeah, there, there's, a, there's, there's food in Egypt. There's job in Egypt. Everything is going well in Egypt. And God says, stay in the land of famine. Stay there. Have you ever been told to stay in the land of famine? <laughs> you, know, you know it hurt. You know it doesn't feel right, doesn't feel good. But God says, stay in there. I got a plan for you that's bigger and greater than you. And Isaac stayed. Why? Because Isaac knew God enough to know that if God says stay, God wants to do something bigger and greater than what he will ever get in Egypt. So you need to be able to trust God enough when God says stay and you stay. And the Bible says Isaac 
stayed as God had commanded him. In verse 3, and he sojourned in the land. And, it, and because God promised that I will be with you. This is what the Lord said. He said, I will be with you. I will bless you. I will be with you. I will bless you. For unto thee and thy seed, I will give all these countries. He would have said, I don't want it. There's famine in the land. The land is dry. Nothing is growing. People are out of job. Folks are, are angry and, and they're all mad and, and they're just irritated. And God said, I'll give you this land. He said, no, I don't want this one. <laughs> I want a better one. You know, God can bring something out of nothing. Yes, he can bring something out of nothing. He can make somebody out of nobody. What, what, he can bring treasure out of trash. That's God because he created everything. He, he, he was, I, for Isaac to stay where God asked him to stay, he was looking beyond the condition of the place to the promise of God. Most of us, we're looking at the condition of our place. The condition of where we are. And we're not looking at the promise of God. God's promises, they are bigger and greater than the condition that surrounds me right now. Because many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivered him from them all. That's what I said, from them all. So, he, he, he was not, he was, he was faithful enough or full of faith enough not to consider or look at the condition of the place just like his father abraham did not look at the deadness of his body nor the deadness of sarah's womb the bible say he was strong in faith giving glory to god Glory to God. That's what we're talking about. A man, a woman, a God who truly believe God in those moments of crisis, you know what I do? You give glory to God. You lift up your hand and say, God, I thank you. I lift you beyond my ability and my capacity. You're greater. I lift you up, Lord, in the midst of my storm. Because I know it when the storm is over, I will still be standing. Glory to God. Because God is on my side. Glory to Jesus. And so Isaac did not consider the condition of the place more important as the promise of God. So going to a place of greatness, I need to learn not to consider the condition of the place greater than the promise of God. If God says, I will bless you. That's the word of God that comes out of his mouth. He said, I will bless you. It does not matter where you're at. He'll make all things to work together for my good. Because that word is going to come to pass regardless of the circumstance, situation that's around me. Because God already released his word. I will bless you. He said to Isaac, I will bless you. Not only you, I will bless your seed. And not only that, I will give you all of these countries as an inheritance. That was enough for Isaac. So uh, famine was not his problem no more because God has spoken. What has God said to you lately? Do you believe what God said to you? What is God saying to you right now? You're sitting in this place right now. The Holy Spirit is ministering to your heart. What is it that you're getting right now? Are you bold enough to hold on to those words? To hold on to those words. That regardless where you are, you still hold on to those words. i never forget this. I'll say it again if you heard it before. Just don't put your hand in your ear if you don't want to hear me say this. Praise the Lord. <laughs> And, and, and this story is so, is, is so touching each time I think about it. This, this family that went out at sea. If you remember, I told you this. Went out at sea. And, and 
a boy, a little boy, a little girl, and their father. And then a storm came. Boisterous. And hit the board, and the board broke apart. The man took the boy and told the, told the daughter, said, hold on to this raft. I'll be back. Let me get your brother to shore. I'll come get you. He couldn't take both of them at the same time. Took the brother to shore. As he was going, the, the wind and the, and, and the wave was getting so much, and he was able to swim to shore and call for help. By the time he would get back into the water, the wave is pushing the scale way, way, way into the sea. But the coast guard, they came in and they got, got to this girl. And she was in good spirit, holding on to that little piece of wood. That's all that she got. And they asked her a question because they were amazed. What gave you the energy and the strength to hold on to this in spite of the waves and the wind and how far you've gone into the water? He said, because daddy told me. I will come back for you. Said so that was it. That was all. That, those words that her daddy said kept her afloat. She didn't let go of that thing because she knew the daddy is coming for me. The shark's around. No, no, no. You are not eating me up because daddy said it's coming for me. Now think about the word of God. What God said to you. Would you and I say that? When the devil bombards us with all negative and doubt. And you say no devil. You're a liar. God told me last night. That I will be with you. I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. God told me last night. I will bless you. God told me last night. I will deliver you. I choose to believe the word of the Lord. And you get out of your depression and out of the position you're in. You say, no, no, I got my mind made up. God said he's coming for me. And you keep yourself afloat. You keep your mind together. You keep your spirit high. How? Because the Lord has spoken. You think it was easy for Isaac? We talk about this and think that, well, it was just easy. Isaac was in family, his, his wives and kids, they are crying. No food to eat. The man was not lazy. But the condition was not his making. He made an effort at least to leave to go to another country to get a job. But God said, don't go. Stay here. It's no good but stay there. Cultivate the land. Is it God telling you cultivate that land? He said, God, I've been trying like Peter. I've labored all night and got nothing. And God said, go back in there. Go to it. You see, our instinct is always naturally reflection. Our instinct is always to flee. Fear, flight, fight. Those are our instinct. Those are natural instinct. That's against faith. Faith stands strong. Faith doesn't fight, flight, or fear. No, that's not faith. Those are natural instinct. It's the nature of man to run away from a condition. Like David, we run to our enemies. He ran to Goliath. He ran away from him. You know, when you look at the, the Ephesians chapter 6, we got the, the arm on your head and the breastplate of righteousness. The, you got a sword in your hand. You get a shield of faith. You, you get a, the shoes. You, get, you got a, 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 your belt around your truth. You know there's nothing on your back. You're not protected in your back. There's nothing in your back. Go read it. Or the armor of, 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 of faith. There's nothing in your back. In other words, God doesn't expect me to turn my back on my enemies. Nor my condition. That's not the expectation of heaven. He wants me to get back in the fight. <laughs> he wants me to stand strong. Having done all, stand. He wants me to stand. Does he want me to turn my back on them? But a lot of us, our natural instinct is to turn our backs. We run from it. No, that's not the will of God for me. It is my faith that makes me stand in moments of crisis and storm and wave and wind. It's my faith in God that God will deliver me. Daddy told me he's coming for me. Therefore, I'm standing. 
The devil can't eat me up. Lions can't feed on my flesh. They cannot drink my blood. If they couldn't feed on Daniel, they can't feed on me. If the fire could not burn Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they can't do it now. Because the same God who was with them is the same God who is with me and you today. And Isaac stayed in there because the Lord said, hang in there. I'm coming for you. He said, I will bless you. I'll give you this land. There's family right now. Things are not all right right now. Just wait on the Lord. Just wait on it. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. It's patient endurance. You know what the Bible says about Abraham? He said, he through faith and patience obtained the promises. That's what he said. Through faith and patience obtained the promises. The God's timing is not my timing. God wants to do it at his own time. That I, I wait for him to do it at his own time. And now he, he sojourned in the land. And in verse 4, he said, God said, I will make thy seed to multiply. God is always in the business of multiplication. He doesn't add. Not that God doesn't know addition, but God multiplies. Just multiplication is better than addition. 10 plus 10 is 20. 10 times 10 is 100. I'd rather take 100 than take 20. I will multiply thy seed, the Bible say, like the sea, like the, like the stars in heaven. That's what it said. God said, I will multiply them. And I will, this is the same thing he said to Abraham, he said to him too. I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my child and my commandment, my status and my law. And in verse 6, what the Bible say? Isaac obeyed. Isaac stayed in that same land where there was famine. But remember, God said, I will bless you. And God did bless him. That's why we read in verse 13. And the man was strong, even in that land of famine. The man went forward, even in that land of famine. The man became great, even in that land of famine, until the man became very great. Glory to God. First of all, he learned to obey God. Secondly, he demonstrated his staying power. That he has the ability to stay even when Egypt was appealing to him. He believed what God said, that I will bless you. I will multiply you. I will make your seed great. And now look at what the Lord started to do. And in verse 11, Bible says, after all was said and done, Abimelech charged all his people saying, He that touched this man and his wife shall surely be put to death. The king rose up one day and made a decree that whoever touches this man, Isaac, and his wife shall be put to death. In other words, God created protection around him. God created protection around him. And this protection will give him promotion. Now, what is promotion? Promotion is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. God, if you would just promote me, I know my life will be okay. Yes, he will. Oh, thank God, God promoted me today. Yes, he has. But it is not an end in itself. A lot of us think that promotion is an end in itself, but it's not. Promotion is a means to an end. Pro means forward. Motion means move. So all God is saying is that move forward. Keep moving forward. So when God gives me a lift, he's telling me to keep moving forward. It, it, the, the idea is not to stay there and brood in there. No. It is, it is a means to get me to where God wants to get me to. It's a means to which God wants to achieve his aim and his will in my life. 
It is not an end in itself. God wants to make him great. God creates the condition for him to start to become great. And so God wants to make you great. God creates the condition for you to start to become great. And that's called promotion. And that promotion is not an end in of itself. It's a means to an end. So I don't see my promotion as the end. I see it as a means to an end. Greater things are coming when God promotes you. That's what it means. It's a sign that greater things, there's something greater that God wants you to achieve for him to promote you. When he moves your step forward, he's not going to stop right there. He's, he's telling you that there are many steps that he needs you to take. So it does not, it's not an end. In the, the same thing with provision. When God provides for you, it's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. If we have time, we go through all of this with Isaac. It's a means to an end. Pro again is forward. Vision is looking, forward looking. So when God delivers some provision in my hand, he's telling me that the moment of forward looking has just started. So that, that provision in of itself it's, it's, it's not to be consumed. It's a seed put in my hand to yield many more seed. But the mistake that some of us make, the provision to us is bread. He gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. There's got to be seed before bread. So when God gives seed to some of us, it's bread. It's supposed to be forward looking. And, and as long as you're not forward looking with your provision, you may eat up your provision. And so when I eat up my provision, then I just shall change myself of my greatness. God wants to make you and me very great. And he creates the condition for us to become very great. But as long as we don't take advantage of those conditions that he creates for us, then greatness eludes us. But if I can begin to see like Isaac, that my promotion and my provision is a springboard to where God wants to bring me. It's a means to the end that God wants to bring me. If I can begin to bring my mindset to that, then I start to take those baby steps. And he was great. And he went forward. And he became great until he became very great. Very great is the destination. But that didn't just happen in one day. He had to was great. He had to go forward. He had to become until he became if I abort any part of that process, then I'm not able to get to he became very great. So it all takes you and me to partner with God to understand what God is doing at every stage in my life and follow him. So what am I saying this morning, ladies and gentlemen? God has a promise for you. God has a purpose for you. What, what God has for you and for me is bigger than what we can conceptualize. And because, and because we cannot wrap our head around it, we are not able to exercise our faith on it. And if I'm not able to exercise my faith with God, I'm not able to obey him. If I'm too enticed by the passing pleasure of this world, Passing pleasure means that they are temporary. It's a fix that go in and out. If I cannot endure the temptation of the passing pleasure of this world to esteem the greatness of Christ more than the, the temporary fix of this world, if I cannot endure that, then I'm probably not ready for what God wants to do. 
am like that training dog that is so enticed in I take off to get my enticement when there's a greater purpose. Because as I take off to get my enticement, I get disqualified from prime time. Can't get on the back of those cruises. Can't be treated like a police dog. I can't be given that medal. Because I just did, got myself disqualified. Too enticed by the world. And, and, and not only that, if, if, I cannot, if I cannot esteem God greater than the condition that surrounds me. Knowing that something greater and better is ahead. And that what I'm going through right now is temporary. That God has the ability to fix it regardless how chaotic it is. Let there be light, there was light. Let darkness disappear, darkness disappear. Let the water separate, it separate. All God was doing is bringing order to a chaotic world. Cosmos. Bringing order. That's all they're doing. And that same God has the ability to bring order to my life, my mind, my emotions, my soul, my spirit, my body. He has the power to do that. If he did it before, he can sure do it again. And Isaac stayed in there. And, and, and when he stayed in there and God started to act, he promoted him. He knew it that his promotion was for a step forward. A step forward. And he wasn't willing to stay on that because the target of God for him was to become very great. Some of us mess up in our first promotion. We mess up in our first promotion. And God is just giving us a glimpse of what he wants to do in my life. And so he, he puts me to the next level and I just mess up in it. But you know God is faithful. He's God of a second chance, God of a third chance, God of a seventh chance. He'll give you the chance again to prove yourself that you truly can bear the greatness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But in all of this, you really cannot exercise faith if you don't know God. You can't believe on whom you have not known. You can't trust whom you have not experienced. You know, I stay here telling, well, you have to believe God. If you, if you have not experienced him, you can't believe him. It'll be so abstract to you. But it's very simple to say, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. Because if I know you, I can believe you. If I believe you, I begin to walk by faith and not by sight. And on my way to becoming very great. Let's bow our heads this morning. Just ask yourself a question. Do I know God as I ought to? Do I know him? Do I know whose I am? Do I know whose I am? If you're not, just tell him. We, we come in the presence of God. God knows everything. He knows my heart. knows your heart. Read it, it'll be plain in the presence of God. And just say, God, this is who I am. I'm not quite where everybody is thinking that I am. Lord, help me. You know, disciples came to Jesus and said, help my unbelief. Because they, they, they felt that they didn't have enough faith in God. And they told him, Jesus, this were disciples who have been with him by three years. Walked with him, ate with him, did everything with him. But they said, Lord, help our unbelief. Maybe you need to talk to God and say, God, help my unbelief. I've not had faith in you enough. I've been looking at conditions and looking at circumstances and things that surround me. But God, from today, I want to change my paradigm. I want to begin to see the world differently from the eye of God. From the spectacle of heaven. I want to see the world. Glory to God. And God is faithful. God is faithful. He would do it again. He would do it again. He will do it again. Glory to God. Father, I thank you this morning. Thank you for every soul that came out here today to listen to these words. Lord, we want to set ourselves on the path 
to greatness. Indeed, God, it's your promise that we will become very great. And Lord, we choose today and we dare to believe your word. But God, there's a price to pay. Help us, God, to be able to pay that price so we can receive the prize. The prize of obedience. Help us, God. The prize of developing our staying power. Help us, God. The prize to look beyond the storm to the heart of God. Help us, God. The prize to believe your word than the words of man or the words of Satan. Lord, help us, God. We leave this place today encouraged. We leave this place today very hopeful that our God is able to do a sitting abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. And to you be glory in honor and praise in the church and forever for in jesus mighty and precious name we pray amen amen and amen if you have been blessed by this message or have a prayer request we would like to hear about it please call us at 401-954-6188 or visit our website at www kingstabernacle.org You are also welcome to join us on Sundays for services beginning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. and for Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 500 Greenville Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. Please remember that you are always welcome at King's Tabernacle where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations.